Amen and amen. We give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercies endure us forever. It's my pleasure and honor to continue with the Passover series. This is my third session. And uh, for those of you that may be joining for the first time, we have two other sessions that I've done, which are on the YouTube. And we want to ask you to subscribe to YouTube, to our YouTube Fountain Gate Church, because this will be alerting you whenever we are live or when we load a new message. Amen and amen. And I don't want to repeat the things we have said before because of time, uh, but just to say that Passover is one of the major uh, feasts, the three feasts uh, that Israel was supposed to observe by the command of God. Uh, you remember the Feast of the Passover, also known as the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, also known as the Feast of Harvest. We also have the Feast of the Tabernacles, which is also known as the Feast of the Ingathering. And as we have said, uh, is that Passover is a feast of transition, mobility, and our progression in Christ. And what a time to expound on this very important topic, uh, which the Lord just spoke to me a few weeks ago, just before we went on lockdown. And I've had many other prophets within our family and many other places confirm this word. And we bless the Lord for that. And for us to progress, in our journey and in the purposes of the Lord, we must observe and do the principles related in the Passover. We are not asking us to practice the Passover as it was practiced by the Jews or the people of Israel because that has been fulfilled in Christ. We don't practice what exactly they did because it has been fulfilled in Christ and also it has been fulfilled in us as his children. But I believe that the lessons that we can learn from the Passover as was observed will help us especially to navigate this very, very difficult moment that we are going through. All over the world there is you know, uh, this issue that we are all looking at. And we thank God that as his children, we are encouraged that our hope is in the Lord. And as we said last, last time, the key to overcoming the current crisis is to hear God, but not only to hear him, to obey him. It's better to obey. You know, we don't just listen, but we obey. So these principles will help us to move forward, progress, in the journey of our corporate purpose. Because our purpose is corporate. As you will see, one of the principle of the Passover is that it was a corporate, it was a corporate observation. It was not for individuals, it was for families. And as we saw in the last session, the Passover announced a new season for them. They had to start a new journey. They had been in the, in the bondage for very, very long. Uh, for 430 years or thereabout, and they were used to the life in Egypt. And therefore, when God came to pronounce a new season for them, he had to bring in a new mentality. They had to change their mentality, how they thought, how they did things. And I believe this is the same thing that God is showing us. So the Passover demanded a new mentality, a new way of thinking, and we have shared that in the last two sessions. The Passover also demanded intense personal involvement and corporate involvement. Nobody was excluded. Nobody was, or, or rather everybody was supposed to participate in the Passover. I want to take you back to our theme scripture, our key text, which is Exodus 12. I'll read from verse 3 to 6 for now. Let's read together wherever you are. God told Moses, I'm reading from the New King James Version, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man, every man, shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father. So you can see every man who is the leader of the house will take a lamb, for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb 
for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. What I want you to see, or even underline in your Bible, if you're able to do that, is that the whole assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel were to kill it. In other words, we see one of the principles of the Passover is that it was a family affair. No one was going to do it individually. No one was going to eat the lamb on their own. It was supposed to be in the context of the family, in the context of the family. And no one could stand afar off and just observe things happening. Everybody had to be part of it. And as I said, everybody had to eat the lamb in the context of a family. And as we think about the season we are going through, this is the best time to keep the family spirit and the oneness spirit because it's a major principle we see in this particular portion of the scriptures. In other words, to exit from Egypt, you had to find the experience and participate in the journey. Therefore, you could not do it as an individual. You had to be part of a household. You had to be part of a family for you to be able to experience that particular Passover. And as we see in verse 7, the blood, you know, when God said, you know, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, the blood was applied on the houses. Verse 7 says, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. So the blood was not applied on individuals. The blood was applied on the houses and specifically the doorpost and the gate, you know, the gate or the doorpost of the house, uh, that is where it was applied. And verse 13 says, now when the blood shall be, now the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And we know that even when Christ died, he, he died to, to, he died for the church, which is his body. And the house here represents the body of Christ. And when I see the blood, when I see the blood where? On the houses, on the families, I will pass over you. And as I said last time, this Passover had two major aspects. One was to bring judgment for those who are not found in the houses where the blood was. And the second one was to offer protection for those who were in the houses where the blood had been applied. And as I said, this blood represents, uh, this house represents the body of Christ, which is the church. And it was applied on the gate or the door, which represents godly leadership. In other words, remember there are in many, many houses. Each of them had to be part of a particular house, and the blood was applied on that particular house, and therefore when the angel of death came, he passed over the houses where the blood was applied, and the blood was applied on the door uh, of, of the houses. Amen and amen. I want to read uh, verse 43 to 51, just for a minute. And the Bible says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover, or rather the principle of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. Again, we see God clearly dictating that nobody who was a foreigner would eat the Passover lamb. They had to be part of the family. In other words, no foreigner was going to be protected by the angel because one, they were not going to eat it, neither were they going to be in the houses. That emphasizing the same principle that I talked about, the principle of family. But every man's servant 
who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, they, then he may eat it. So there was a condition. So God said, no foreigner will eat it. But if you have a servant or you have a hired servant or a foreigner who is circumcised, then that person must can eat it. Verse 46 says, in one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation, you can see the emphasis on the congregation, on the assembly. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep this Passover to the Lord. So it could have been a servant. It could have been a, a stranger. Now, if they wanted to keep the Passover, now that God had said no foreigner shall eat it, again the Bible says that let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. So there was a condition. And you know, God had already given Abraham the law that every male would be circumcised as soon as they were born, I think on the eighth day. And that uh, brought in the, the principle of the covenant that God had with Abraham. In other words, God is saying, anybody who is not in covenant with him would not be allowed to eat the Passover. So no foreigner could eat it unless he was circumcised and became a native of that land. And he became a native of that land by circumcision. What does the Bible tell us about circumcision in the New Testament? I want to read Romans, 20, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 28 to 29. The Bible says, For he is not a Jew who is, who is one outwardly, nor is circumcised that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is in, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Let me read from the New King James. Uh, take us back to 28. I read it again. Amen. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So we see the circumcision in the New Testament is different from the circumcision in the Old Testament, which was in the flesh, but in the New Testament is in the spirit. And you know how God will circumcise us or how God circumcises us in this season is through his word. The Bible says, you know, because for you to be circumcised, there must be a knife. There must be a sharp knife for you to be circumcised. And we know the knife is in the Bible, which is also the same as a sword, is the word of God. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. So there is a requirement for us as we celebrate this Passover for us to allow God to circumcise us through his word, to deal with us through his word. Hearts can only be changed by God's word. Hearts can only be transformed by God's word because God's word is the one that God uses because the sword of the spirit is the word of God. When you read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to 13, the Bible says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And what does it do? Piercing even. So the word of God cuts through. The word of God comes to circumcise our hearts. It pierces even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrows, and is a designer of thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
So as Paul will say in the Romans 2, 28 that we read and 29, that the circumcision we are talking about is not outward, it is inward, it is not in the flesh, it is in the spirit, it is the circumcision of the heart. That circumcision happens by the word of God. And you see that in Hebrews 4 that we have just read, that the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows and is a designer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature, the Bible says, there is no creature hidden from his sight. And you know, for circumcision to happen, one has to be naked. One has to be exposed. And the word of God is able to expose us and be able to remove the excess flesh. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who, to whom we must give an account. You know, many times we are worried of what people think about us, of what people say about us. And it's important because the Bible says a good name is better than rubies or riches. But it's not the most important. The most important thing is, how does God see us? Now that we are not hidden, there is no creature that is hidden before him. Our lives are exposed to him. So we must continue to expose our lives to God's word, which is a two-edged sword. Then God's word will be able to pierce our heart and will circumcise us and remove the excess flesh. That is why in this season, what you need to guard most, what I need to guard most is my heart. That's why the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it comes the issues of life. So in this Passover time, we must be circumcised. And the circumcision comes by the word of God. And we must guard our hearts against many things that I talked about last time. You can go and see one of them being bitterness. This is not the time to be bitter. You know, there is all temptation to be bitter. There are always people out there to make you bitter. But don't be bitter. This is the time to guard our heart against hardness. The Bible talks about, you know, that they could not hear his voice because of the hardness of their hearts. And as I said, the key to overcoming the crisis of this season is to hear God's word and to obey it. But you can only hear God's word if your heart is made of flesh. If your heart becomes hard like a stone, then the word of God cannot penetrate. You see, a knife cannot cut a stone. A knife can only cut something that is flesh. So for you, for the word of God to penetrate, the condition of your heart is very, very important. Therefore, I pray that God will help us to, to, to not be bitter, to not allow anything to harden our hearts. And the other thing I said, you must guard our hearts against is against murmuring and complaining, keeping a heart of gratefulness, a heart of of gratefulness. So we, we really thank God for that. So what did I say? I said one of the principles of Passover that I've shared in the last two sessions is the principle of new mind. The principle of new mind because God has announced a new season. The second one that I've talked about is the principle of family and that God is looking at us as families. The Passover was all about families, and we must be members of that family, and we become members by being circumcised, and the only way we are circumcised is through the word of God as we have seen. The other principle we see, it was also a time of corporate sacrifice and corporate wholeness. It was a, type of, a time of corporate sacrifice for corporate wholeness. So God looked at the entire uh, assembly and he looked at them corporately. Even the sacrifice they made, it had to be corporate. And that corporate activity of the entire community bound them together in a sense of common mission and purpose. So that is one, one of the prayer I've made, especially for us as, as Fountain Gate Church and other people who are friends, is for God to bind us with one common purpose, 
with one common aim, with one common mission, and that comes through that corporateness. So in this time, even though we are separated by distance, we must endeavor to keep the oneness, the oneness of the brethren. You know, we should not allow the spirit of individualism. You know, when everything is about me, my, and I. This is the time to embrace the spirit of corporateness. And you know, the spirit of me, my, and I is an orphan spirit. Is an orphan spirit. People who are orphan, who have a spirit of, 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 of being an orphan, they are ever complaining. They are always looking for handouts. But this is not the time to think about it that way. This is the time to take responsibility, participate in the corporateness, participate in the corporate sacrifice, corporate wholeness, so that we can depart or start this journey together. Amen. For the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, and I'll be coming back to it, but let me read this particular portion. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. You know, in the Old Testament, they took uh, the lamb and also they took the bread, the unleavened bread. In the New Testament, Christ talked about one bread. We are one loaf. So there is a great need for us to have that oneness, one, oneness, oneness of purpose, oneness of mission, oneness of anything that we want to do. Do not separate yourself from the body. This is not the time to do so. Even if you have been angered, even if you have been offended, make it your aim to be part of the body because only within the body context can this thing pass over you. Nobody who was outside the family, you know, was safe. If you are outside the family, you are not safe. You had to be inside the family. So this is the time to emphasize oneness. This is the time for us to continue uh, reaching out to one another and having one purpose. And our purpose, as you know, is to please God. So we must emphasize personal and, I mean, we must emphasize on corporate oneness. Amen. It's a principle of the Passover. The other principle of the Passover that I want to share in a short while is that there was a great emphasis of personal but also corporate purity. There was a great emphasis of personal and also corporate purity. Verse 17 to 19 of Exodus 12, I'll read it. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generation as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off, shall be cut off. He will not be part of the congregation. Shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. So we see this condition of removing leaven. So the command was to remove all the leaven from the houses. And if you had leaven in your house, if you had leaven in your house, you could not participate in the journey. Therefore, you were to be removed from the congregation. And that means you were not part of the Passover. Now, I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. And time fails us to go into details. Just allow us to give this uh, seed thoughts, which we'll be revisiting as we go along. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 to 8 says... Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lamp? You know, leaven is the same as yeast. And the role of leaven is to make something look bigger than it is. 
you know, if you want to, if you want to have a good example is the chapatis that we make. They are not leavened. They have no yeast. Therefore, they are flat. They don't rise. But the mandazis we make have yeast, and therefore they rise. So you can see a big mandazi, but inside there is nothing. That is the work of living. And uh, the Bible says your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little living, even a little, leavens the whole lamp? Verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old living, that you may be a new lamp. You know, one of the things I know is that God is removing us. From the old, from the old. There is a newness that is coming to us. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lamp, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover. Therefore, you see the connection there. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. We need to remove leaven because Christ, our Passover, that means he, he was not living, he did not have living, he was sacrificed for us. Therefore, we must remove the old living that you may be a new lamp. Let me tell you, one of the things God is going to do in the midst of this crisis is to raise a new church, a new church whose mind is renewed, a new church that is after God, a new church that will bring uh, and manifest Christ on the earth. There is something new happening. Church, do not be blinded by the events that are happening. Do not be caught up in the, co in the conspiracy theories. Do not be caught up in all those things that, are, you know, they, that have their place. Our focus right now is what Christ is making us to be. We are purging out the old living, the old mentality. We are bringing in the new lamp since truly we are and leave it. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. So you can see that now this is the New Testament. As I said, they were not celebrating the, the, the actual feast. This was already past Christ. Not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And Galatians 5, verse 9, we'll talk about again a little living, leavens the whole lump. So Paul tells us, keep there on verse 8. Paul tells us, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In the Bible, shortly, leaven represents one doctrine the doctrine of the Pharisees. There are many scriptures, but let me read Matthew 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in verse 11, Jesus said, How is it that you do not understand that I spoke not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of leaven of Pharisees and the Sadducees? Verse 12 says, Then... They understood he did not tell them to beware of the living of bread, but of the doctrine. Because you, re you remember, bread represents the word of God. Bread represents the word. But of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So we must celebrate this Passover with the purity of doctrine. We have to leave the old living. The old living that is a living of mixture. There are many things in this season that God is going to redefine. One of them being the latest, that the church is not a building. The church is ecclesia. The church is a called out people. And the church thrives. And no forces will be against the church because the church is built on Christ. And therefore, we must remove the old living. The old living, which is the doctrine of the Pharisees, while the unleavened represents the pure doctrine. You know, one of the work of the living is to exaggerate, making something bigger than it is really. And that is what the Pharisees were. You know, they showed themselves what they were not. And that was the doctrine. And in this time, those churches, those individuals that will stand the test of time are those who have the pure 
doctrine. In other words, doctrine that has no leaving. Doctrine that is not exaggerated. Preaching the word of God in its purity without adding anything. We cannot continue having a mixture. This is the time God is going to purge us, his church, and remove all the living, all the old, old, old things. Be able to remove all the mixture. First Corinthians chapter 10, I want to read it. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 to 22, the Bible says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The blood, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And you know communion is Passover. I think we have explained that. For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel. That's why, you know, these things were written for our admonition. We observe. You know, observe Israel after the flesh. Now, for example, we are looking at the Passover. Are not those who partake of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Verse 19. What am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with the demons. You cannot, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord. That is the emphasis I'm making. That in this season, there will be requirement for purity of doctrine. Because we cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. And you remember Jesus um, giving the bread and the cup on the Passover night before he was crucified. Observing the Passover. So we cannot drink the cup of the Lord, and the cup of demons. That means there are people who are mixing. It's, it's, it's a mixture. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of table of demons. We have to decide as a church. This is the time to remove anything that is not scriptural. This is the time to go back to the foundations of the word of God. This is the time to resist any doctrine, any teaching, any practice that is not aligned to the word of God so that we can remove the old living because we are becoming a new lamp. Can I hear an amen from wherever you are? And he says you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So the living is a representation of the doctrine of the Pharisees, an exaggerated doctrine, a doctrine of mixture, a doctrine that is outward, a doctrine that is impure, when unleavened bread is a representation of a pure doctrine, and we must do away with the old leaven. Unleavened bread also symbolizes the requirement of purity of worship. Purity of worship. You know, redefining some of these things. You know, before we, we had a lockdown, we, we preached about worship. That worship is not singing. Singing is an expression. It's one way we express the worship within. But worship is a lifestyle. You know, worship is the way we live. Worship is serving God, etc., etc. But unleavened bread symbolizes the requirement of purity of worship. That is why, and I can give you the scriptural references because I, I will not be able to read. The use of leaven was strictly forbidden in all the offerings made to the Lord by fire. The use of leaven was strictly forbidden because of the purity that God needed of worship. You can refer to Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11. You can refer to Leviticus chapter 7. Verse 12, you can refer to Leviticus 2, 11, and you can refer to Numbers chapter 6, verse 15. No grain offering. For example, a basket of unleavened bread. Every offering signifying the purity of worship. So as we remove some of the things, the old leaven, God will redefine worship. God is going to bring the purity of worship back among us. That was the, a principle of the Passover. Leaven is also a picture of hypocrisy. It's a picture of hypocrisy. 
in the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, Let me read from New King James. In the meantime, when a new barable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled on one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaving of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So leaving also represents hypocrisy. And this is a season for us. It's God's children. It's God's church to do away with any form of hypocrisy. Unleavened bread, unleavened bread, which is what God asked them, represent a heart filled with sincerity and truth. That is why the Bible says they continued uh, steadfast, uh, steadfastly with apostles' doctrine, uh, with fellowship, with the breaking of bread and prayer. And the Bible says they ate with the simplicity. It has to do with singleness of heart. It has to do with uh, truth. Sincerity, we must bring back sincerity and truth. It speaks of our right internal attitude and transparency. There must be transparency. We must be people who are transparent. We cannot be hypocrite anymore. We must remove the living. We must remove the living. It's not what people think about me. It's what God sees in me. It's the truth. And I must live in the truth. And I can repeat the verse we read again. Uh, in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 to 8, your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lamp? Verse 7, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lamp since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Verse 8, therefore, therefore, let us keep the feast. Which feast? The feast of the unleavened bread. The feast of the Passover. Not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice. So, you know, there is old leaven, which represents an old way of thinking, doctrine uh, that are uh, demonic, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Because leaven, as I have said, represents hypocrisy. So my dear brothers and sisters, God is giving a call to us, to you and also to me, that we may remove leaven from our midst. You'll notice he said they'll eat it, the lamb, with unleavened bread. You see, the lamb represents Christ, and we eat Christ by his word. The unleavened bread, pure doctrine, pure worship, and a life that is sincere, a life that is truthful, a life that is transparent before God. That is why Jesus said, you know, that the kingdom of God is for children. Why? Children represent innocence, and we must come back to sincerity. We must come back to the innocence. You know, many of us have been corrupted. You know, living also represents corruption, and many of us have been corrupted. We were so sincere when we came to the Lord. We, were, we loved him. We, we loved the brotherhood. We didn't, have, we didn't have all these things. You know, brothers are, sisters are. We didn't have that hatred. That thing came, crept in as we walked along, as we had many experiences, as we got offended and all kinds of things. And a lot of living came into us. And we are no longer pure. We are no longer transparent. We are no longer innocent. This is the time, brethren, to lift up our hands and say, we are removing living. We are becoming sincere. We are becoming truthful. We remove any kind of hypocrisy. We are going to be pure before the Lord. And with that, I want to end this session. I hope that God has ministered to you. And I ask you, respond to God's word. It's not about, you know, other people. You know, I came to learn it's not what people think about me. It's how God sees me. And when God sees me, he will reward me openly. He will not reward you in secret. You live your life in secret, but the reward is open. So I ask you, brethren, to respond to God today. Especially many of us have been filled with a lot of living, a lot of anger, a lot of insincerity, a lot of hypocrisy. 
And may the Lord help us this day, even as we respond to his word, so that he can cleanse us and we can be able to celebrate this Passover that the Lord has given us. Amen. So tell your neighbor, if you have one, that this is a new season, this is a new day that God has given us, we are removing living from our houses. Amen. 